in the deadly jungles of Vietnam, a daring group of unsung heroes emerged. Armed with only a flashlight and a 45, they plunged into the Viet Cong's vast network of underground tunnels to search and destroy a determined hidden enemy. Braving pitch darkness, booby traps, poisonous snakes, and suffocation, only a courageous few volunteered for this terrifying mission. They are the Tunnel Rats of Vietnam. One of the most controversial wars in history, the Vietnam War, redefined guerrilla warfare. Faced with overwhelming and superior American firepower, the Viet Cong took the conflict underground, creating one of the most extraordinary battlegrounds of history. Secret interconnecting tunnels and tunnel cities that stretched for hundreds of miles. For years, these tunnels served as headquarters, hospitals, communication outposts, food depots, ammunition caches, and even as homes for the Viet Cong. The extraordinary American and Australian soldiers who volunteered to crawl into these claustrophobic and pitch black shafts to hunt their elusive enemy came to be known as tunnel rats. For them, the tunnels meant booby traps, rats, poisonous snakes, suffocation, shootouts, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and in many cases, death. It was a brutal experience, and no soldier who came out of it alive ever forgot it. I came across rotting bodies several times. It didn't revolt me. I was just an animal. We were all animals. We weren't human beings. Human beings don't do the things we've done. An old Rover, 25th Infantry Division strictly voluntary basis, uh, you didn't have to go in a tunnel. Uh, if you went in a tunnel and freaked, you never had to go back in a tunnel again. Uh, there was one thing, there's one thing that will give me dreams and I've had dreams about, and that is the thought of being buried alive, of, of uh, being trapped underground, not being able to get out and your air slowly running out. I, I can't imagine a worse way to die. I, I'd rather be shot or blown up or something, but the idea of being stuck under there with no, running out of air, it's that slow death. Um, I have awoken in the middle of the night with, in a cold sweat thinking about that. The Viet Cong and its earlier incarnation, the Viet Minh, had been digging underground for decades. The crisscrossing maze of tunnels were so vast that many villages were connected by these underground shafts some tunnels led all the way into Saigon itself. Barely wide enough to squeeze through, the tunnels reeked with an unbearable stench, making it difficult to breathe. Good, the tunnels stunk, so anyway, all the time, so it, whether there was anybody in there or not. They had their own latrines in there and things like that, so it was pretty, pretty game in there. It's a real musty, kind of heavy air the tunnels were made up of a complex maze of vertical and horizontal shafts that led to underground bunkers and depots. Every tunnel and shaft were separated by skillfully camouflaged trap doors and exit points. What made the tunnel system even more incredible was the fact that most of it was dug by hand. Laterite or the dirt, the earth there, uh, was so easy to dig in 
But once the air hit it, the walls almost set up like cement. So they didn't have to use shoring and all that. They just dug the tunnel. And uh, when the dirt dried out, it was almost like cement. So, uh, I mean, and they dug away. And, well, they were digging since the French were there, you know, and they were fighting a bit, bad men down there. So there had been, they were, they'd been digging tunnels for 80 years. So there was quite a complex of tunnels there. The Viet Cong used the tunnels to mount ambushes above ground. With only a handful of soldiers, they would demoralize and stop a much larger American force. Most of the danger came from walking through an area that was infested with tunnels and what we call spider holes, just small, you know, maybe this big around holes that these guys could pop up out of, take a shot, hit a guy in the back, pop back down. Everybody gets down um, and uh, we find out we got a man down. It'll make. Once the Americans located the entrance to the tunnels, volunteers would be called to crawl inside and clear them. But the Viet Cong had one great advantage over their American counterparts. They knew the tunnel layouts by heart, while the Americans never knew where the tunnels led to and where exits and trap doors were. Many times the idea was to tie a rope, simply tie a rope around your leg, and uh, so that if anything happened, uh, say one person going down, they could at least pull you out, pull the body out. Had my M6, I remember I had my M16 and that flashlight, and I went down the steps into the bunker and it was pitch black, but I could see light at the other end or the, where the other entrance into the bunker was. And I was so scared that I focused on that light on the other end of the bunker and I had the flashlight in my left hand, my M16 in my right hand, and I walked towards that light. And there could have been 100 people in that bunker but I didn't look left or right. And I just, I said, all I need to do is make it to that light and I'll be okay. So long as you don't know if you went down or, or how deep you are or anything. So we figured, uh, well, we'll never find a way back because it was, so, it was just honeycomb. So we just keep going the way we're going. We're bound to, there's bound to be an exit point at some point here. And uh, I know during that, that time, uh, we noticed the, the cutaways in the, in the sides of the tunnel where people had been sleeping. And we're talking about maybe, uh, oh, dug in about two feet into the wall, about six feet long, which is plenty big for a Vietnamese. Most of the time, I think, uh, well, most of the time you're gonna go in there and kind of sneak. You're gonna be as quiet as you can. But there's been a few times where I kind of yelled. Cause there's been times where a lot of times I go in a bunker or some tunnels and I throw a grenade in there first before I even go in. We would always take plenty of grenades you can you can um, get rid of anybody that's down there just by throwing a frag grenade down there. If uh, if it's booby trap, you know, one of their booby traps, it probably will set off that booby trap. So you're, you're you know killing two birds with one stone there when you throw that grenade down there. Now most of the time there wasn't anything there, but if you did, uh, if, if he was down there, it was it was going to get him. And uh, just a very simple thing, just always grenade you know frag the thing first, and, and you would have a lot better shot at making it. Often armed only with a handgun and a flashlight, the tunnel rats had to crawl in complete darkness, trying to navigate only with their senses and intuition. The first thing I would say about the experience in the tunnel is this, that is very few people, at least very few sighted people, uh, can imagine the total absence of light. And, and it's one thing to say the old cliche about you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. That's the only place I've ever been where it was absolutely true. If your flashlight was turned off and you were, let's say, 100 feet around the corner from your entry point, you literally could not see your hand from your face. Because I swear, you've never seen darkness till you go to Vietnam. Shafts and trap doors posed the greatest threat to the soldiers. They didn't know if there was an enemy soldier below or on the other side of a trap door until it was too late. So they would position themselves right there at the opening of the tunnel and, and wait till you get close and, and pop up and shoot. And uh, that uh, I saw that two or three times. I saw one uh, one unfortunate young man who's, who was new. He didn't exactly know what he was doing. He crawled up 
At least he knew enough to get down, but he crawled up to a tunnel and looked over the edge, and he was shot right in the face. The guy was just sitting right, right there. One of the tricks I heard was they would wait for a couple guys to run tunnels, and, and when you went up through a trap door, when you stuck your head up through there, they'd take a steel or a bamboo rod and run it through your neck and, and pin you there in the tunnel. And, uh, of course, it'd freak out the guy that was with you, and, and you didn't have to worry about anybody running the rest of the tunnel. The VC had developed a technique that uh, I think they used against the French, too, earlier, uh, where one man would stay at the tunnel, take a piece of bamboo, sharpen, and jam it to the midsection of the person coming down, uh, all the way through to the other side. Well, this, this accomplishes several things. First of all, it puts this guy in a big hurt, and you cannot pull him out of the tunnel because he's got the bamboo stuck all the way through him. So it effectively seals the tunnel. The man has a chance to leave the Viet Cong. Uh, this is a very disturbing way to die. There's a lot of screaming, a lot of shrieking. It's not instant death. So it's de demoralizing to the people. The threat was so great, and the anticipation so nerve-wracking, that even the slightest movement in the distance forced the soldiers to open fire. But firing your gun in such a closed space created its own problems. When you shoot a 45 in a tunnel, you know, I think you immediately go death, because, you know, uh, you holler, you scream, uh, your heart's pounding. I mean, it's it's all reaction. You really don't think. You just start shooting, and you want to get out, and you want to get out any way you can, you know. And and running tunnels, you develop the ability to not think but shoot, because you don't want you don't. If you take that, if you hesitate and think about it, you're the one that's probably going to die. So if there's movement or, or noise, uh, you shoot. Well, we just looking for the enemy, and hopefully you didn't find anybody. Yeah, it's, it's it's bad when you if you're out in the open, you seem like you have a better chance. But in a closed-in area, I was always scared to death if I shot it, blow my eardrums out. I mean, I would have, but it's something you don't really want to do underground in a tunnel. If it wasn't the formidable enemy, it was rats, snakes, and sometimes bats. We got around this corner, a guy shone, shone the light around there, and about, it looked like, it seemed like a million, I'm sure it was several hundred bats just came right at us through this, this little uh, you know, five square foot vegetable. You could see them from about, I don't know, 10 or 15 yards away coming right at you. And all we did, all you can do is just lay down flat and you can feel the wings hitting you on the back of the head and on the back. and There was all kind of, uh, you know, things you had to watch out for in tunnels. I didn't run across it. You know, the, the one story was that they would take uh, bamboo vipers and, and nail their tails to a board and hang it from the ceiling. You know, and you're going through there in the dark, and, you know, uh, and bamboo viper, we called it the three-step snake. You know, uh, they bite you, you take three steps, and you were dead. Because I've been in some tunnels where there are scorpions in there that look like a foot long. And they'd be like a 45 sticking you, shooting if one of them babies got you. Because I've shot them with 45. And that sounds silly. But it looked like a lobster in there. It's not no little scorpion like you see here. We got big ones in Texas, but there's nothing that big. I don't know if it's the climate or what that makes them extra big. The American military machine had not prepared for tunnel warfare in Vietnam. So volunteering to be a tunnel rat meant on-the-job training. We actually had no training on it. You know, it was just one day you went in a tunnel and they told you, well, watch out for this, watch out for that. So fear keeps you well alert. Uh, being alert, uh, being lucky, having the Lord watch over you, a uh, whole combination of things. So uh, no special skill or anything. Throughout the war, 
The Viet Cong were short on supplies and weapons. They relied on the waste of American soldiers to supply their tunnels and feed the soldiers hiding and camping there. Leftover American canned food, parachutes, batteries, boots, ammunition were all collected once the American soldiers moved out of the area. Truck tires were used as sandals, napalm canisters were used as plates and pots. They had nowhere to go get supplies, they had to do it all themselves. Um, as opposed to, to our situation where we were resupplied every day, every evening really, with ammo, whatever we needed, food and things. So they had to pretty much carry, either carry what they needed or stockpile it, carry it and stockpile it and come back to it. And that's what, one of the things they used the tunnels for. They had stockpiles of stuff everywhere. Um, it was very common to find a small tunnel entrance, explore it, and find a cache with maybe 30, 40 weapons. Soldiers even discovered a South Vietnamese tank six feet below the ground in the tunnel complex that the Viet Cong used as a command center, with its batteries, lights, and radio still running. The American army was desperate to knock out the tunnels and either drive the Viet Cong out of them or trap them inside. In fact, they tried while I was there. I remember several things were trying to knock out the tunnels. One of them was pumping water. They'd bring these big pumps, the size of a Volkswagen, big diesel pumps, bring them out by helicopter, Chinook, drop them by the river, connect tubes all the way, maybe 100 meters, 200 meters to the, uh, the entrance to a big tunnel and pump water, literally pump water all that day and night uh, for weeks into these tunnels. Well, it sounds good. It sounds like you're getting rid of the gophers, but uh, we found out later that the VC had a way of sealing those things. Where the water wouldn't penetrate. And I think another thing they used to do was they would dig shafts, vertical shafts, as far down as, as they needed to to get to a porous strata, and the water would just go out like a drain, you know, like a bathtub. So it was partially effective, I think, in the short term, but when they figured out what we were doing, they would, they would figure out a way to seal their tunnels. Their tunnels were in three levels, usually. So if they just sealed off the first level, that still protected the, the next two levels. When pumping water didn't work, they tried gas. Um, another thing they tried was pumping gas down, or CS gas. And uh, CS gas is basically an industrial grade uh, tear gas used by the military. Uh, it's very strong and uh, uh, they would pump it down in there <clears throat> and just try to permeate the, the different tunnels, um, the air shafts, everything with it. The gas was only partially effective as well. It wasn't long before it was discovered why. For the most part, they were able to seal those off too. And they, we also, one of the things we used to find in the caches down there we'd come across for gas masks, homemade gas masks, made of simple gauze, simple, simple plastic bags and things, and they'd tape the gauze in there and wrap around their head, and then it was their gas mask, and it worked. Uh, we had $300 gas masks that didn't work, the ones we carried, you know, so. Uh, they were just brilliant at, at uh, simplicity. That, that's The Viet Cong proved to be so resilient and resourceful that the Americans were forced to adopt a more drastic approach. Relentless carpet bombing that turned the area into a desolate moonscape. I think the, the Americans figured out the only way they were ever gonna neutralize them is just to destroy them. And they, uh, they started carpet bombing, B-52s. Um, I mean, there were airstrikes in there all the time. You know, the F-4 fans, during the firefighters would come in, drop their bombs, they'd always leave a crater. But carpet bombing by B-52s is an entirely different thing. Anybody's ever been close to a B-52 strike uh, can tell you it feels like an earthquake. And uh, the first thing when you see one, uh, by the way, I think B-52s are not allowed to, to bomb within three miles. They're not supposed to, anyway, within three miles of their own troops. That's how dangerous it is if, they, if they're off a little bit. The tunnel rats were a special breed in the Vietnam War. Other soldiers saw them as gung-ho, mean, adventurous, and even insane. But everyone respected them for their bravery. I don't know, we got, kind of thought we were normal, you know. Uh, we weren't no heroes. I didn't consider myself a hero or anything like that, you know. I was just a, a grunt like the rest of them, you know. I've always, 
you know, the guys that didn't make it and stuff, you know, they were the heroes. Uh, you know, the guys walking around the Congressional Medal or, or, or awarded that. We had a, a lieutenant sergeant. Uh, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. You know, he was the hero. I think the, the guys that went down felt like they're doing something that not, not very many people could do. And some some people force themselves to, to I'm talking about bravery even, I'm, I'm talking about just some, uh, sort of a confidence and sort of a, uh, a, a youthful, macho approach to life at that point that a lot of young guys have. Uh, and, and you know, the tunnels are, are terrifying to some people, claustrophobic people and so forth, and, and other people they're not. I'm proud I fought from a country, not just, I'm, I'm just proud I fought from a country. If I was a tunnel rat, that's fine. It's it made me feel good that I went in. I felt good, real good when I come out. You know, it's, you go in there and not see nobody, but when you come out and you, and you can breathe, you've done something good. <laughs>